Suppose for just a moment you and I are disciples. Rocked in the boat on a storm-ridden sea. Suppose, if you will, the, the winds and the storm that constitute this small maritime crisis are the current and economic and political issues of the day, or perhaps some personal or health crisis. Suppose that the fallout from this storm is that we become anxious and are tempted to lose our faith. The more some things change, the more they seem to stay the same, as the old saying goes. One can extend this metaphor widely in our world today. It would probably fit rather keenly not only the current economic picture, but the jobs market, the dueling political factions in Washington, D.C., European and American immigrant crisis, consequences of inflation, and many other concerns of modern day life. There's no one here this morning, I guarantee it, who hasn't experienced this reading in some way or another. Waves breaking over the boat of our lives, anxiety provoked by some form of chaos. These events change our lives in important ways and often cause terror and unrest not only for ourselves, but for also for those whom we love. The question, even for church-going people, is, doesn't God care that we are perishing? This question is also found at the forefront of our first reading from the book of Job. Why do humans, even the faithful ones, suffer? Metaphors likening our current economic outlook to any serious personal crisis like a typhoon are not far from what we hear in our gospel reading for this morning. Storm imagery, at least in the Hebrew scriptures, is called storm theophany. Why? Because God appears in these clouds and the thunder. And there and there is that all-important question that was asked by the disciples as our Lord sleeps, seemingly unconcerned, in the stern of a boat that's on the verge of destruction, one that's been uttered countless times throughout history, don't you care that we are perishing? Do you not care? It's the cry of a people in distress who are at the loss to understand things going on around them in any generation. But it's also implicitly the cry of people who trust in the ultimate power and goodness of God. We do not, after all, cry out to God in pain or in anger unless we ultimately believe in God's power to guide and to aid us. This is seen in the gospel reading for this morning. The disciples, full of newfound trust and love for Jesus Christ, are asking him to do something. They do so because they believe. This is not simply a test of Jesus' power. In the end, he claims, it calms the winds and the storms with simple words a command to the heavens that there be peace, and peace there was. The grace in this moment was that Jesus came to the aid of those who loved him. We, not so unlike every faithful generation of disciples, face life-changing and culturally challenging events. We're faced with imminent changes in our environment, drastic changes in the way that market forces seem to work on this world stage of business, some countries in the world seem to be on the verge of anarchy, and if not anarchy, then war. It seems to me that the world needs, to borrow from Mark's gospel, to cross to the other side. This notion refers, my friends, to a great deal more than sailing from one shore of a lake in the Galilean countryside to the other. Crossing to the other side is about the experience of change. It's about transformational change whether people were living in Jesus' time or in our own. And these transformational changes can occur, but not without our attention to God's desire for peace and reconciliation. As any society attempts to cross to the other side, the natural response to this degree and rate of change is anxiety. Many of the human cries in our own time result plainly and simply from fear. Psychiatrists and sociologists have often called our current age the age of anxiety. Will I be able to provide for my family? What's going on in the church? Jesus answers this question. He does so in the midst of what the disciples perceive to be a storm of lethal proportion. And what he does is to grant them peace. And this is possible only as a result of their belief in him. Who, I ask you, 
are the workers of change in this world. Jesus empowers these disciples to do his work in the world. You, you and I, sitting here this morning, are empowered by the grace of God as the stewards of goodness in this world. We become the hands and the arms of Jesus Christ in a world that is desperate for good news. What we cannot appreciate about our Lord's calming of the sea from the brief reading this morning is that it occurs among a group of people who have only rather tentatively declared their belief in him as Lord. A question that frequently and repeatedly occurs in Mark's gospel is also asked in this morning's reading. Jesus asks, who do you believe that I am? Interestingly, the parallel passage in Matthew's gospel has a, a slightly different wording. The exasperated descry of the disciples once the wind has arisen and the waves are beating into the boat and filling it with water is not to call him teacher. Remember in Mark's gospel, the disciples asked, teacher, do you not care if we perish? In Matthew's gospel, they say, Lord. They simply say, save Lord, we are perishing. Jesus' power to calm the seas and the winds and to work his miracles is born on the wings of faith, of human belief in his power, no matter how tentative. As we shall see over the coming weeks in the next chapters of Mark's gospel, there's a series of miracles that take place in and around our Lord's hometown of Nazareth. Interesting there, people lack even the faith that we've seen from the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. Our belief is the fertile soil that nurtures the divine power to redeem, to heal, to sustain, and yes, to calm the storms of life. And we will see these themes continue to unfold in our readings this summer and this fall. What we've seen on the Sea of Galilee holds true also for the institutional church in the early decades of the 21st century. The church needs faith to raise her voice collectively and say, Lord, we need your help. From my perspective, one of the greatest disservices that the age of reason has bequeathed to the modern living has been to give people too many alternatives to believing in God as creator and sustainer of all that is. Many have come to believe in the healing power of human reason. We place our faith in economic autonomy or on personal wealth and beauty. We have too often forgotten about our reliance on God for the very gift of life and for our being. Sometimes the sick turn to God only as an afterthought when all other avenues of human reasoning and, and autonomy have been exhausted. This doesn't cast any doubt in my mind, mind you, on modern medical therapeutics. Believe me when I tell you, I'm very happy that they exist. But I also see these as products of human creativity and intellect coupled with the divine will for our life, our health, and our joy. It is, in times of personal or economic or social upheaval and uncertainty, very tempting to forget that faith is a defense. Not simply because it calms the seas and tames the winds, but because I believe that God wants us to reconcile to all of creation. God asks us to believe. And God's gift for our faith, through his Son, everlasting life. The greatest physiologists of our own time can teach us all increasingly in intricate detail about how life exists, but they have very little to say about why life exists. We have to explore different avenues to gain any real insight, I think, into the whys. And that pilgrimage for faithful Christians ultimately leads us right back to God. The story of the storm on the Sea of Galilee is a tale that encourages readers of Scripture to answer one vital question for Christians. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Over and over in Mark's gospel, the question is asked. In this morning's reading, we discover that he is the tamer of the wind and one who the seas obey. He is the son of God. And that, he, that becomes clearer as we reach further into Mark's gospel. But Jesus becomes the son of God most fully for us through the lens of our faith. In that faith, all divisions cease, all wounds are healed, and all that appears dead is made new if we can hoist our sails and just sail to the other side. From side of reason, self-sufficiency, and unbelief to the side of believing and trusting in God. The results are as different as a different shore. 
In doing so, we cross from sin and death to light and eternal life. We move from being victims of circumstance to the stewards of God's grace. In chaotic times, it seems we desperately need to be united as a people of faith, living together in the loving embrace of God's mercy. We need to trust in our Lord's power to tame the winds and the seas and to lead us to shores where we, acting alone by our own power, simply cannot go. And in doing so, we shall realize the greatest blessings of his calming peace. It is, as Dame Julian of Norwich, the late 14th and early 15th century mystic, concluded in a time that was racked by fear of death by the Black Plague. She said in a famous quotation that placing all of our hope and faith on God would result in the right end. She said, and I quote, in the end, all will be well, all will be well, and all will be very well. These are wise words for an anxious time. For with God in Christ, all will be well. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.